Cubs, and welcome to Fed Up Recovery Podcast. I'm Kim, and I am recovered from an eating disorder, and I used to work in an eating disorder clinic, and I'm here to talk about eating disorders and things like that. Today, I'm here with my sister, Jenna, for a second time, and yeah, let's get started. How you doing, Jenna? Good, and also a disclaimer, I have not had an eating disorder but I have had friends who have, and I've, um, yeah, just been through experiences dealing with, um, me and you. other people. <laughs> yeah, right. I've right. dealt with, <laughs> well, you for a while. <laughs> right. Sure. Um, so to, yeah, today we are going to listen to some, or read some listener emails. So let's start with that. What's our first one? The, Okay. So our first listener wrote, what was the hardest part about being hospitalized? Hmm. So for this question, uh, there's quite a few different answers because, you know, there's different reasons why people would be hospitalized for an eating disorder. Um, What was your experience? Yeah, that makes sense. Like talking about my experience being hospitalized. So... I was hospitalized sort of like three times essentially for my eating disorder. The first time um, <clears throat> for anorexia being low weight and that included getting like a lot of, going to a lot of doctor's visits, I guess, if you consider, yeah, consider that hospitalization. I've never been like completely hospitalized being in a hospital for a few days. Like some might be, um, I never had the feeding tube while I was anorexic, and some people do. If you get to a low enough weight or if you're really just not eating, um, this can kind of be romanticized, the feeding tube. Um, In what way? What do you mean by that? Like, among anorexic people, it's kind of like, um, it's like you won almost a little bit, like mm-hmm. when you get the feeding tube, especially if you have a feeding tube and you're in a treatment center, it's like you're the sickest. Like there's something that gets mm-hmm. really messed up in the eating disorder brain where it's like, how sick can you get? Like how skinny can you get? And it's like, you got to the point that, you know, you, you need a tube to feed you. It's like so close to dying. It's mm-hmm. like this weird winning thing, which is really, really sad. You know, it's really messed up mm-hmm. that, um, idea. But yeah, I never got to that point. So that would probably be horrible to have that. I imagine it would be really painful and gross and just scary. So thankfully I never had to do that. Um, I did have, when I was bulimic, I had a problem with potassium levels. Like, I don't exactly know why it is, but potassium is super important for your health. And it can cause heart problems if you have too low of potassium levels. So I had to have an IV of potassium. So this was in the hospital? Or? Yeah, it's yeah, okay. it's like, it didn't take like multiple days, but it took a day mm-hmm. and they have to like at least check to make sure that your levels mm-hmm. are getting back up. So um, were you there just for the day? Or yeah. Was it? Okay. Mm-hmm. And then going back into like the treatment center. So I went to like a, res- I was in a residential treatment center the first time for, I don't know, 60 days or something where it's like 24 hour care. Basically they have doctors there. And then the second time, yeah, that's when I had the low potassium levels, and that was that was more in a hospital too. So it was like <clears throat> the top floor of a hospital in St. Paul, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And um, yeah, that that was just, it's just kind of painful. Like the the um, IV and the IV freaks me out, and yeah. So we're talking hospitalization versus being in a recovery center. Yeah, I guess the the lines kind of blur then for me because I. Because you've done both, right? Yeah, yeah, both. Hospitalization for me would just have been like the day of like getting my like medical stuff checked and then going into the twenty four hour treatment, which has like an element of hospitalization. It's kind of like, mm-hmm. like you get checked every single morning for your heart rate and your blood. Like a nurse comes in, like nurses live there with, with you, so it's like a step down from being in a hospital. I think the hardest part of that in general is just, like, letting go of your eating disorder. Like, you've been doing mm-hmm. it for so long. 
especially like it was hardest for me when I was anorexic because it's like you get to this point like you worked so hard for it essentially mm-hmm. and then you have to like let it go it's obviously really good to let it go but it's hard to be suddenly mm-hmm. forced to do stuff like to eat and to not exercise and all these things that have been giving you comfort and easing your anxiety and suddenly mm-hmm. you're like you know, you're like forced to stop yeah because then it's more than just gaining weight it's changing your whole mindset mm-hmm. right Ideally, eventually. I think initially you're not quite there yet. Yeah, like part of hospitalization and 24-hour treatment is usually, it's just like just getting the eating down. And that's why like you have to do the step-down procedure afterwards and not just go from 24-hour treatment to like back on your own because you haven't done any yeah. of the brain work yet, the therapy really. Because, yeah. That's why I learned when I was working in the 20, I was working in a 24-hour treatment center, like a residential treatment center. And they taught us that, like, that was part of, like, our training was understanding that while people are in the 24-hour treatment center, it's, like, eating disorders mess up your brain so much. They, like, slow your thinking down. It's, like, the therapy that people are doing during this time is just kind of not that effective because... One-on-one, like, weekly therapy? Yeah, yeah. People will also do weekly therapy while they're in this treatment centers. Okay. Um, But it's, like, yeah, it's, like, you're too messed up in the brain to, like, you're too tired and you're too stressed you're too anxious to really like get down to the therapy work so it's kind of it's helpful and it's but it's more of like in the moment stress and anxiety dealing with so you have to like keep doing therapy afterwards so yeah and just eating (laughs) Mm -hmm. like as far as being in the hospital or like being in the treatment center it's hard doing that it was hard doing all the meals all the time um, it's like the best way to recover to like eat all that time. But like when you're, yeah, it's just change. What do the meals look like when you're at a recovery center? Um, <laughs> um, I don't know. It depends on where you're at. I think that mostly for the structure of a recovery center is you're going to have, like you wake up at like seven sometime in the morning. It's like you have to get up early enough to like make sure you get all your meals in. So, like, you get up at 7 or something to have your breakfast so you can have a snack. You have a snack at 10. Mm-hmm. It's, like, structured around, like, a meal, meal, three meals and three snacks. So you have a yeah, meal at breakfast at 7, snack at, like, 10, lunch at noon, snack at 3, dinner at 5, <laughs> snack at 8. Like, it seems like a lot, you know, mm-hmm. but it's, like, really the best way to weight restore or to maintain your weight while you're in treatment. Um and it's not, like, it's not even that free, it's not that much, you know, it doesn't, mm-hmm. like, it just seems like a lot, like, it seems like all you're doing all day is eating, mm-hmm. and, because, like, you don't really do anything else, like, you're in this, you're in, like, a locked down, like, we're locked down, you know, you can't leave. Yeah. You can, you can, like, leave, technically, but, like, the doors are, I think, I think one place the doors were locked. Yeah. Or at least, like. At least, like, there's someone at the desk, and, like, you know, it's, like, you can't just come and go okay. as you please. You're, like, kind of, like, in there, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's, like, you're just in this kind of little block. You're just eating all day. So it's... But, um, but you know, like, still I eat, like, this much, but I just do other stuff during the day, so it just doesn't seem like my day is so focused around eating <clears throat> these days. But, like, as far as the meals, like, what they look like? Just, like, regular food. <laughs> um... There's a whole, there's a whole, I can get into the whole stuff later about, like, what the balance of the meals would be and, you know, stuff like that. But that could be for another time, I guess. Fun stuff. Yeah, fun stuff. I do like talking about um, meal planning and recovery because it's, it's interesting and helpful. Helps me still. Yeah. So is that enough, do you think, for that question? Yeah, let's move on to the next question. <clears throat> Reto. <laughs> radical okay i have a lot of dumb sayings like i've been saying like tight and rad and dope a lot lately and i get made fun of for it those words Should are really be. boring aren't they that's weird i have no idea where i got them from they're like surfer words from the 2000s mm-hmm. it's unfortunate okay so our next listener it's not really a question as much as it's like she wanted us to talk about it So she wrote in saying that people should stop romanticizing eating disorders. Yes, so much so. Eating disorders are, what, the number one cause of 
death in mental health world, like <clears throat> through suicide and through um, just heart failure, you know, a lot of medically medical associated problems with eating disorders. Mm -hmm. So yes, they're not romantic, they're like horrible and it's weird. It's weird how they're romanticized. I think like while I was putting together this podcast and like putting together YouTube videos, I'm spending, like I never really did this in my recovery, like did a lot of the online community for recovery. Um, I guess when I had my eating disorder, like Instagram was less popular. T Tumblr was, I used Tumblr. And Tumblr was, you know, Tumblr. Mm. Yeah, is it still popular? People still I don't use it. Know, actually. Yeah, it's like it's more of like a what is it more like a scrap? It's like a scrapbook kind of yeah. on the internet, like where it's like pictures and like gifs. Gifs is it gifs or gifs? Gifs. 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 I like thought that, but not that I'm saying it. Okay, so yeah, it's so I used to like blog a little bit on Tumblr, like oh my god, I'm so sad. Um, but what was the point? Oh yeah. On YouTube, there's so many of these videos of, like, my story, and it's, they do these pictures of, like, before and after, and it's just so dramatic. It's like, okay, that I'm really happy, you know, that you, the gained weight, you know, like, weight restored, but, like, it's, like, so many of, like, people love to post, like, the thin pictures mm -hmm. and, like, their anorexic pictures, and it's really triggering for people. Like, it propels the idea that, like, you have to be really skinny to have an eating disorder, and, like, it just... I mean, like, the Pro-Anna, there's still the Pro-Anna websites. And what the, is that? Um, oh, like, Pro-Anorexia. Yeah. yeah. Saying, okay. Yeah, like, whole <laughs> websites devoted to, like, people trying to have anorexia and, like, giving tips and... That still, still exists? exists? I am sure. Yeah, I'm sure. It's horrible. Um, yeah. It's like, what do we do, you know? Yeah, what would you say if someone was... Um, like, just kind of makes nonchalant comments about, you know, eating disorders and like, oh, I wish I had an eating disorder and that way I could lose weight or, um, like, oh, she's so thin, she probably has an eating disorder, like, lucky her mm -hmm. or something like that where it's just like, you know, looking at an eating disorder, I'm like, oh, she's, oh, she's so skinny or something like that. Yeah, I think that's the misconception that people think. Like, if, they, if they're not educated enough or if they've never met anybody with an eating disorder or they just haven't, like... Yeah, they haven't experienced it. They think that it's like a quick weight loss tip, almost like because yeah, you when you lose weight, having anorexia, you lose weight, restricting, you lose weight. You really don't lose weight, bulimic. That's kind of like purging doesn't help you lose weight, which is what one of the things that helped me recover. Kind of is like after a binge, then I learned that I had a psychiatrist tell me that like you know you only lose like fifty percent of the calories or something when you binge or when you purge. So it's like, like, I don't know how they studied it somehow, which is kind oh, of fascinating right. to yeah, me. Like they, know. they measured like the calorie intake of people. I don't know how they do that. <clears throat> like how they do that. They can measure like the calorie of the food that's in the per in the, the vomit, you know, and the calories before it's crazy to me. But anyway, wow. it's these things, these things actually help. It's like the fact checking stuff mm -hmm. that helps in recovery of learning that like, it just helps you like think more like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm purging, but it doesn't really help me lose weight. Um, anyway, sidetrack. What were we talking about? Romanticizing. Romanticizing it. And um, people who say they wish they had one. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, um, yeah, they're not a quick fix diet. Like, no, my God, a lot of it, like, especially the more you get into it, of course, like it's just, it's like a coping mechanism, like anything else, like any other addiction, really. There's like, it's just a way of not dealing with problems and of masking pain and of easing anxiety. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not healthy, mm -hmm. you know, and these people aren't happy. Like if you have anorexia or bulimia, like you're suffering. And there's so many long-term effects. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it happens quickly, like you're not... I think that's the problem is, like, people, it's like you're, like, they'll praise you until they're, like, oh, but you're too sick now. Like, now you're, you know, like, when I started losing weight, when I, oh, okay. yeah, it's like I started getting anorexia and I was losing weight and, like, I got so many compliments, like, people in my class were, like, oh, my gosh, how did you do that? Like, I want to do that. And just, like, even, like, my coaches, like, all of my what? running coaches, like, okay. I don't know, they're, like, yeah, you lost weight, you're going to run faster now. Like, people would say this to me and it's crazy, like, how much that affected me and made it like perpetuate my eating disorder. 
-hmm. And then like I finally, and then I got skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. And finally I got to the point that people were like, my mom, or <laughs> I guess, yeah, sure, whatever. My mom told me that I looked like a, like a ghost or like a, what did she say? Like I look like a, f I don't know, like a skeleton, just like stuff like that. That's like, oh, but you're like, you've gone too far. Like, you know, like you, it does get unattractive because you're, which unattractive is kind of, I don't know if that's the right word to use, but like, it's just not healthy. Like I started losing hair. I, you get all the fuzz on your body cause you're so, you're so thin that you're mm -hmm. so cold. And I also lived in like Bemidji, Minnesota where it's, um, freezing. So it was like, I had anorexia at like 30 below. <laughs> Do not recommend this. <laughs> yeah. With a car that didn't have heat. God. So anyway, what you're, you get to such a low body weight that you're so cold that your body develops, like it starts to grow hair. I forget what the word is for this hair, but like oh. you get like this fine hair all over your body because it's like, we need to do something to stay warm. It's freaky. Um, you lose hair, you know, it ages you faster. Um, you're just not like feeding yourself, right? You're not getting vitamins. You're not, you know, you're just not getting enough. Your body needs all this stuff to like mm. look good and glow and function well. And yeah. Um, so do you think, how would we, like, what would you t tell people who are romanticizing eating disorders? Is it just that there should be more information about the reality of it? Or like, how do you educate people who are continuing to perpetuate this idea that eating disorders are, like, exciting or good or, like, romanticizing it? Like, what would you, what would you say to them? Yeah, I'm curious, like, which point, which side to start from because I, I think both people do it like people with eating disorders mm. can tend to romanticize it um like from a victim yeah kind of or? like yeah victim like okay. i don't know but that's tough to say about that um on the other side i mean it's like just yeah in general like not having enough education i think on mental health is a big problem because people do that for a lot of things like we people say the wrong people just I don't know we don't have the right vocabulary out of a lot of things with mental health terms yeah like, mental oh, health terms in, or like yeah which like really harmful you know like she was having eating disorder she hasn't you know where you just throw stuff around like it's yes anything yeah and like just because that's I mean she's just saying that like oh she's so skinny she must have an eating disorder she must be anorexic you know mm -hmm. it's like that's perpetuating the idea that eating disorders are just for people that are skinny and mm -hmm. it's like oh like it's just like eating disorders are way more complex than just like a weight because mm -hmm. people can be skinny and not have an eating disorder people you know there's like people there's tons of medical reasons that people have are thin so then they're you know they might have Crohn's disease or whatever I don't know um and then but it's not anorexia it's just they're not mental health so then they'll be suffering from those comments as well yeah, just we need to keep educating people, um, and, and just like be cautious about what you say. You know what? How you're using those terms and not throwing things around and mm -hmm. just being aware how it affects people. Yeah, yeah, totally. And um, make, yeah, being honest about stuff too. I think people that like I try, I'm trying to do that with this podcast and with everything is just like being really honest about my experience and not making it like. So, um, dramatized, yeah, so dramatized yeah, and like, I guess so. Yeah. And like saying the like not feeling ashamed to talk about the stuff that's uncomfortable mm -hmm. and like the depression and like the gross behaviors and just like how much it like fucking ruins your life, <laughs> you know, like how much I could have accomplished without having an eating disorder. It's like, yeah, the weight loss is just nothing. Um, so yeah. And I think in films, too. I think films have a problem with romanticizing them. In what way? Do you have any um, specific films? Yeah, I have a lot of problems with... I think we should get into that more in other episodes, too, like, taking mm -hmm. apart different oh, films. But, I mean, one of them is, like, it's so ridiculous, like, that... Um, I do, like, kind of like the film, but... um, What is it? With Win uh, Winona Ryder in the 90s. So, yeah. In the movie Girl Interrupted... Um, I would say they romanticize mental illness a bit and get it a bit confused. 
Um, it's really good. I like the movie a lot. I think I liked it because it was the first movie that I saw that was like kind of about mental health that I kind of related to. Um, and I really like Angelina Jolie in it. But she's like really thin and plays this kind of erratic character and I thought she was really cool and I think she kind of romanticized like that a bit of like being really edgy and cool and sexy. Well, and having an eating disorder? I, 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 I don't know if she had, she didn't necessarily be portrayed as somebody that had an eating disorder, but I think she was more like portraying someone that might have like like borderline or borderline um, disorder. Um, yeah, but there's one character in it it wasn't really clear either what she was suffering from. Um, I forget her. I think her name was Daisy. Daisy. But Daisy did this thing where she... So they lived there in this room. But Daisy did the thing where she would eat chicken under... She had, like, would keep chicken... Like, rotisserie chickens under her bed and, like, pick at the bones and, like, eat them. And I never really... I was really confused about what that was about. But it felt kind of, like, bulimic behavior to me. I was wondering if she might have that. And in a weird way, like, I related I related to it because I would do kind of weird stuff like that, like, not keep rotisserie chickens under my bed. But, um, yeah, just kind of, like, picking at food in a weird way. And, um, yeah, just someone that had, like, bizarre behaviors around food, I kind of felt, like, yeah. related to. So I actually really liked her character. Um, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, we should do that. We'll, we'll go into that in a later episode, I think picking apart different movies about eating disorders and um yeah there's a couple tv series that i think are pretty good that really portray eating disorders better i think there's one called maybe skinny like a short tv series on youtube about a girl with bulimia i think that's what it's called but i'll go back and look yeah that's an interesting topic though anything else about romanticizing eating disorders that you'd like to throw out Any personal experiences you've had by other people or romanticizing them? Um, not really. <laughs> not necessarily. I think just in general. Um, yeah, having a better. I think yeah. The takeaway, I guess, would be having a better understanding of mental illness in general, and putting more information about what, like, the actual, like, being honest about what the health problems are associated with eating disorders and supporting people that have them and just, like, watching comments about them in general. Yeah, I think it's a good takeaway from that. So, yeah, I think that'll be it for today's episode. I'm making a cabbage soup right now, so I'm going to go finish that up. What else are you going to have with your cabbage soup? I'm going to have um, sandwiches. Cheese sandwiches. I'm also making a fresh bread. I'm gonna put um, cheese on and toast it like a grilled cheese sandwich. I guess that's what that is. And soup for tonight's dinner. I'm really excited about it. Don't think that you are. Uh -huh. <laughs> I look a little bit disappointed. <laughs> it's good. Anyway, okay. So thanks for listening today. Stay tuned for our next episode. And take care of yourselves. And we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Goodbye.